Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee was founded in 2014 by Ed and Courtney Lemmix alongside their son, Brett. The delicious DeLuna blends are a product of Ed's discerning palate for the finest coffee beans on the planet, and Brett's business acumen has them on the national radar for quality. Savor the simplicity of Graffiti Bridge. 100% Colombian beans roasted to a city roast for optimal flavor. Ed and Brett are both FSU alums and are extending a special offer to our listeners. Use the promo code WORDCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit thelunacoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. WarChant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closers only. Now here's WarChant.com's ass on Hunchavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up. What is up? It is Wake Up WarChant. It is fueled by DeLuna Coffee. DeLunaCoffee.com. Come explore our world of coffee. Take that promo code WarChant15 over to DeLunaCoffee.com and save 15% on your order. Reminder, them bundles, y'all. Them bundles are back. Palafox Place, you get a fantastic tumbler and some sweets as well to go with it. Me personally, I've been a 1559 guy, but Palafox Place and 1559 battle for my top spot on my pour-over selection. So go with Beach and Blend when it comes to cold brewing, everybody. That's how I roll. DeLunaCoffee.com. Warchant.com, your ultimate seminal sports source. Promo code Warchant30. Hit the thumbs up, everybody on YouTube. Come on. Take a break here for a few seconds. Hit the thumbs up. All right. Come on. All right, good. Five-star rating and review on the Apple device as well. We'd appreciate that. Uh, we would be, myself and Corey, Corey coming here in a minute, uh, topping off the show. We were supposed to do like a wrap-up of the basketball game, but, um, I mean, what's what's there to talk about, everybody? Uh, I mean, I know we're a Florida State-centric show, uh, but that game was just fairly uh, unsightly. It was not an entertaining watch by any stretch, but Florida State was able to kind of uh, hang in there. Although, like, Pitt, really? It wasn't like Pitt deserved it either. Uh, Fifth straight loss for Florida State. Can't even keep up right now. Fifth straight loss. 56-51 Pitt wins. After the game, Leonard Leonard Hamilton, Aslan, if you could speak, lamented the injuries, lamented the lack of an inside offensive presence, lamented the missed layups. Uh, It's just... It's where we're at, everybody. It's where we're at, everybody. I'm not going to bum you out. Uh, they get back at it Saturday at North Carolina, 2 o'clock. Uh, try to start salvaging something. Start trying to figure something out. They don't sound defeated, though. I mean, Hamilton talks about watching the film, trying to figure out what they can do. So, um, But, hey, what can they really do at this juncture? We'll talk more about it uh, when we do our Renegade Express mailbag come up here in a minute. Did want to send a shout-out to our guy Danny at Zaxby's. Uh, Danny's been with us for such a long time. Uh, your guy here had his buddy in town who was with his bosses, mind you. And it's my buddy Mercedes Mike. He took me to the Masters. So to uh, even my debts, uh, I got him tickets to the pit game. And now there's a multitude of ways people of our ilk that work in the media can try to procure tickets. I went through one of the more, you know, sort of, how do I phrase this? Kind of the one that you do if you work in the media. There, there's like a liaison you can kind of reach out to and get tickets. Um, they were not very accommodating. And like I'm I'm on StubHub, everybody, on Wednesday, and there's like $6 tickets. And I'm like, why am I getting sweated to get tickets? Anyhow, our guy Zaxby's, or Danny rather at Zaxby's, uh, I'm like, I think you got tickets to uh, basketball games, don't you, big guy? He's like, yeah, man, what you need? Boom. Four tickets of the game, two of them which are like literally behind the replay table, so you're practically on the floor. Uh, My buddy gave that to his boss, so that's good for him. Uh, He works for Mercedes, everybody. Maybe we can all get a voucher. We all can maybe drive a Mercedes Benz. So that was cool. Shout out to Danny at Zaxby's, helping your guy out. Uh, We appreciate him. Maybe munch on some Zaxby's this weekend, everybody, after the North Carolina game. All right, I've uh, tap danced for enough. Not that I had to. You know, well, hey, I just went for like three minutes talking uninterrupted. It's amazing. I feel free. I almost don't want to toss the Renegade Express right now. Maybe I'll start talking about whatever's on my mind. Don't have anybody interrupting me. I can kind of get my thoughts out in clear fashion. I can make a point in maybe 30 seconds and kind of go ahead and pivot to the next topic. Um, but, you know, we don't need to do that. Let's see Renegade Express. Corey and myself tackling all your questions. 
time to get on the ponies. Probably talk a little football. It's Renegade Get Express. All these questions come from our value subscribers or subscribers. Try and talk so fast. Over at the Tribal Council, warchant.com. Corey, let's start off with the guy that used to call us, Gator Kirk, Mr. 757, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Wake up. Do you believe, he says, asks, the best metric for total wins next year will be determined by the odds makers over under? Huh. FYI, last year's over under was five and a half wins. Yeah. I've enjoyed the Knowles coverage provided by Warchant. Thank you for making each day a little brighter. Go Knowles. No, man, I don't let Vegas set my expectations, Gator. I set my own expectations. We're out there every day watching practice mm. on the Zooms. Uh, working the sources. Uh, it's crazy, though, how in incredibly accurate they are. I would think the over-under for this season is like, what, six and a half probably? I would think, yeah, I think they go up one. Yeah. You got Duquesne, which, again, should be an automatic. Um, so, really, it's five and a half over the next 11, you know, basically, like 50-50. Um, yeah, I would, say, I would set it at six and a half, I think. I think you'd get uh, – Pretty good movement on both sides. I would think that might be pushed up to seven and a half, maybe yeah. if there's a bunch of bullish Florida State fans out there. But I, yeah, I think six and a half is a great number. Okay, that is a good metric. Uh, we do like the overrunners. Can't wait for that start to stuff dropping. And they usually, it's a pretty good predictor, right? It's not. It's not foul. It's not infallible. Like they do make mistakes and teams overplay what they're supposed to do. I'll, I'll, I'm sure Wake Forest last year wasn't nine and a half or ten and a half or whatever they ended up with wins. But, yeah, by and large, that's a pretty good judge of uh, what what the talent level is on the roster. I feel like Clemson's over-under was ten and a half last year. Well, they nailed it, right? It was ten. Yeah. 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 So, uh, The Walking Knoll, 01. What's up, guys? I just took four college exams on Tuesday. First off, that should be illegal. Second off, I need some encouragement. Basketball looking rough. Football months away. Please tell me we are thinking baseball will be good this year. I need to see an early season victory over the Gators. Is it likely this year? Thanks for everything. Go Knowles. Yeah, Meat's got their number down there, right? We're good. Mm, We're back. Yeah. We're back. Well, look, when you have a you have a staff that's pretty darn stacked like this one is, you certainly have a chance in every midweek game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, they should have a chance. Sure, I mean, Florida's got good arms, too, because it's Florida. But yeah, they, you know, Meat's not afraid of those Gators. Meat Meat beats those guys every year, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. He so does. yeah, you got you got nothing to worry about there. Um, and sorry about the exams. Four in one Oof. day does seem that's nuts. What do you just, not four finals, obviously, because we're in February, but just right. four exams all coming on the same day is pretty. But don't don't they let kids today like use their phones and their and their computers? I assume all, all you guys are cheating. <laughs> I don't know, but I know they get their results back, Ricky Tick. Like, you know, we yeah. submit our blue books and our scantrons, and it was like, all right, you'll, let, you'll know. And you had to go to your professor's office and see the grades posted on their door. Now it's yeah. like, what, Blackboard or something they call it? You just go on the on, on the internet, boom, boom, boom. Who do you think wins the national title uh, from the big three first? Like Norvell, Hammer, Meat. I'd say Meat. Although I think he's got the hardest path. You can maybe argue Hamilton does. NCAA tournament. Yeah, I'd say I'd thing. say I'd say meet. I think that's again, you keep giving yourself chances. Get you're always you're almost always I well, you are always gonna be in the postseason. Um eventually the baseball gods will reward you. You'll get hot. You'll get hot at the right time and go win something. I think if they make it to a regional this year, they will have set a record for consecutive regionals. So, oh, all right. There you cool. go. Something to be proud of. S Quinn, six seven. Wake up. Travel plans nailed down for New Orleans in September. Probably won't be attacking Bourbon Street like we did back in 95 and 97 for the Sugar Bowls. However, it's more likely I will be able to remember the whole weekend. So that's good, right? Absolutely. We want to savor these memories now. I know it's still seven months away, but I'm looking forward to starting the season 2-0. and It's mm. got to be better than our last big FSU road trip, which was the 2018 uh, voyage to the crappy town of South Bend. I yeah. agree. The Notre Dame reps around campus are very hospitable, but in the stadium, the fans are a holes. Well, I was there in I was there in two thousand three, so they really didn't have a lot to talk about. Yeah. But uh, I was there in eighteen, so was Ira. But we were in the press box. They had like clam chowder or something in there, or they had some sort of hearty soup chowder in their press box that kept me warm. So I appreciate them. But yeah, you people that braved that game, woof. 
that's dedication. That just that team was going. Yeah, because you knew what the then. deal. You knew yeah. that was going to be a blowout uh, as soon as you your plane landed. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we had a con- conversation about that on headlines where people, where Jeff and I were both talking about how um, they had heard the same thing about Notre Dame fans, like in the stadium. And I was like, well, that's you know, I guess because I was there in two thousand three was the last time I was there, and that and their Notre Dame team was horrible, and they got beat by thirty seven points. So yeah, I guess they had no reason to talk and be obnoxious. But when you're beating Florida State 41-13 to 13 or whatever, it's a night game, uh, so probably imbibing a little bit. Yeah, I can. but, man, all fans are obnoxious. Think about the Notre Dame fans that were in South Bend the night before the Florida State game in 2003, and they might have run into these college kids from Tallahassee. That's right. What do they think of Florida State fans? You know what I mean? It's all, you know, our, our own personal experiences, it's hard to, we, let's just not judge an entire fan base by our own personal experiences with a, with a few, with a few rotten apples. No B- offense, you're not rotten anymore, no, Aslan. No, no, I've found the, I found the way. Uh, BTW, by the way, uh, when Corey makes it to the JCS, that's the Jeff Cameron Show golf tournament at around noon. Maybe he should be in charge of spraying champagne on the winner. Have a great mm. time watching the Super Bowl. Go Knowles, Esquin, class of 1993. It's a good idea. Although Aslan isn't a big fan of the way I operate champagne. Well, you know, there's, there's rules. There's decorum. Let's get the yeah. pop on camera. Let's get the good right. stuff on camera. <laughs> right, exactly. JT Knowles, 2K2. This looks like a new person. Hey, Aslan and Corey. Wake up. Well, I'm new here. They are indeed. They joined January 2nd, 2002. This is their first ever post. 2022? 22. I'm sorry. I apologize. That's 22. Lots of twos wow. there, Jade. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to indeed. the show. Indeed. Welcome, man. Maybe you'll be the, the catalyst for the turnaround, for the climb. Yeah. Well, I'm new here, so I'm supposed to say where I'm from and famous people from there. I am from Pensacola, home of former Knowles Derek Brooks, Reggie Johnson, as well as current Knowles Darius Washington and Keyshawn Helton. Yeah, Recently right. moved to Milton, home of another seminal great, Greg Allen. Lots of talent up there. Question yeah. is this. Would you rather beat Clemson or Florida? I'm torn with this one, says JT Knowles 2K2. I mean, the easy answer is Florida, right? Yes. Well, I just really want to beat Clemson, in small part due to the fact that it could help propel us to the top of the Atlantic, and also I would want to see Dabo's face after FSU finally beats him. However, the major reason I want to beat Clemson is due to the fact that when we play them in October, I will have graduated middle school, high school, and will have gotten my associate's degree since our last victory over Clemson. That can't be true. Is that true? So 14, yeah, 14 was the last one. So if he was in eighth grade and 14. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Four that's years of high school, two years of yeah, seven. Yeah. That's oh my gosh. Yeah, man, I think Clemson's the answer. Not not just because it's been a while since our man saw. You know, he was in eighth grade. He was prepubescent um, the last time Florida State uh, uh, beat Clemson. But also, yeah, it helps the uh, it helps the cause in trying to get to Charlotte. And that's the end game, Aslan. That's what we're all looking for. Get yourself to Charlotte. Give yourself a chance to win the title. Um. But for Florida, he continues, my parents and I are essentially the only FSU fans in our extended family. There's no better way to celebrate Thanksgiving weekend than a victory over that team from Hogtown. Thanks for answering my question, and go Knowles. This is just, I guess you're right on either of them. It's, there's no wrong answer to this one, but right. I'd say Florida. Just I know Clemson's in Tallahassee as well, but losing to that team, you, just losing them in Doak is just it's, it's insufferable. Just, no, don't want that. Not that dude, his first year. Um you know, that's the last game you're going to play for probably 30 days at least. That's just a lot to stew on. No, no, not that's not true. Not if you've advanced to Charlotte oh, for nice. the ACC championship. But you're going to be playing eight days later, mm. not seven, because you're playing on a Friday night. And what way to what better way to celebrate celebrate Black Friday than a win over your arch rivals? I get it, but. Even if you don't win that Black Friday, which is fine, it might not happen, you know that in eight days you've got, you've got that extra day to prepare for the rematch against the Canes or the game against Duke or whoever you're playing from the Coastal. If Florida State beats Clemson, are they in Charlotte? No. I mean, I, it certainly helps the chances, but I would still think that... Uh, I will say yes. I'm, I will say They'd yes. have to beat NC State. NC State would have to lose. If they lost NC State, NC State would have to have two losses in conference which isn't out of the realm um they always seem to disappoint when they have high expectations so yeah that's it yeah sure i'm okay i'm gonna switch you're right i'm gonna go with you they're they're in charlotte one day the guy on the 
buffalo wing was riding around in a forest. Wait, 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 hold on, man. It wasn't a buffalo wing. It was a buffalo he was riding. No, I'm pretty sure it was a Zaxby's buffalo wing. And he was eating a new buffalo garlic blaze boneless wings meal from Zaxby's. It sounds delicious, but it wasn't a... Yeah, it was a guy on a buffalo wing. Well, now I'm hungry. I- I'm heading to Zaxby's. And don't forget to listen in for the Zaxby's indescribably good player of the week every Monday on Wake Up War Chant. Old dads and old wake up, guys. Rough stretch for the hoops team. We have injuries, I get it. But if we were going to give the coaching staff kudos the last few years for the team rolling, is it fair to give them a little grief in this stretch? My opinion only, but there have been quite a few head-scratching games this year. I'll provide some examples. Hard to get offensive rebounds like Prieto did when way too many times there was one person shooting and four standing outside the three-point line. Raquan Evans best driving and shooting, yet he continues to fire it up from the outside. Against Virginia Tech, after 39 minutes of watching two guards torch the team, we still were using the defensive scheme uh, that had not been working the entire game. I don't want Aslan to read a ton of these. I read all of them. You did it. Uh, but there are more. I love Coach as much as anyone, and I realize it's a unique situation personnel-wise, but come on, man. No one has any issues evaluating the football coach, so I guess my question is, how do you guys feel about the basketball coaching and strategies this year, in all caps? Love the show, old dad. It's just, it's everything is all about expectations, right? I mean, I know we expect the team to maybe sneak into a turn, but I I will never hold them to such a high, almost an impossible standard as I do the football team, so that's why I don't, that's why there's no venom in me here. Um, no, but like, you can also like it is fair to point. It's a fair to criticize. Like you know, Leonard Hamilton isn't beyond reproach. Um, he could be criticized. Kay could be criticized. Bobby Bowden was criticized. So yeah, it is fair. And and you know, I think we did talk about. It, at least I did. I tried to. Um, you know, that Virginia Tech game plan was just ridiculous. Um, the fact that you you're trying to switch one through five, you haven't figured it out by now that McLeod can't do that, and Ingham can't do that. And all it's doing is putting so much pressure on your defense that everybody has to collapse because they can't stay in front of a six-two guard. Which how? Why would they? They're a foot and a half taller. Um, that everybody collapse and it it leads to wide open threes. And you know you you have to be malleable. You have to be able to adjust to the 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 roster that you have, not the roster that you want. And when Osborne's out, you don't have the roster that you want. So you have to figure out a way to uh, coach where you can still keep McLeod on the floor. Now it became a moot point because McLeod got hurt. Um, so, you know, I, I would say these last two games, I don't know what you what you would really criticize. I, I, and I'm talking about, sorry, the, the Wake Forest game on, on Saturday specifically. Um, like, what, what can you really criticize? And Clemson even, for that matter. You're down a bunch of players. Um, you can only do... They're not good enough to overcome the loss of three and a half to four starters. It's just not who they are. Um but yeah, I think before that there were re- there were real reasons uh, for criticism for this year's team. It doesn't mean I'm criticizing them as a coaching staff on the whole, like they've done a horrible job with this team or this program. But yeah, in game decisions, game to game decisions, being very stubborn on uh, with your defensive principles, even when you don't have the maybe the uh, the talent level that you're used to and the body type that you're used to, you can't. Maybe it's like a square peg in a round hole. Maybe go find a round peg. Um, I don't think they did a great job of that this year, but I don't know. I don't mean to be be on the fence. I don't know that it would have mattered when you lose the guys they've lost. You know, again, this losing streak started with Mills and Osborne being hurt. Mills stayed hurt. Evans didn't play a game. Then Polite went down and McLeod went down and John Butler went down, and you're having to play a walk-on 26 minutes, who gave you good minutes, but he was exhausted by the end. And any time Wake Forest missed a shot, uh, they weren't. Florida State was not getting the rebound because they didn't have anybody there to get a rebound. So that's, but Polite's like one of your best rebounders too. Not just a guard; he's one of your best rebounders. So uh, it, they're really hurt on the glass. They got some real issues, obviously. But yeah, I think it's fair to criticize what they did when they were mostly at full strength. Yeah, I, I know a dude that works in Baton Rouge on television, and he like used three minutes of his sports cast, which is a lot. Um, I mean, most people only get three minutes to do a sports cast on your local news. And he used it to criticize Will Wade, just basically like, hey, you know, if we're going to criticize Ed Ogeron and, and the football yeah. program, like this guy needs to get some criticism too about the way he's coaching this team right now. And he was just getting destroyed on Twitter, like terrible take, quit your job. I mean, like people are really upset. It's like, really, LSU, you care that much about basketball? Well, and I also um, don't understand what the – I mean, I didn't see the the – 
the, the take. I didn't see the three minutes, so maybe he was off base in what he was saying. No, it was I fair. Hope that, it was strategy stuff, just like he was yeah, pointing out I hope they're not like yeah. – so I don't hope they're not criticizing him criticizing because, yeah, yeah Will Wade are. is – well, that's crazy because they've lost like six of seven games, and they're a talented team. Um, and he has not done a good job with that. And he's he, – again, it's Will Wade. Who is he? Right. Um, you're you're you know, other than a, a cheater, um, so like it's like who is uh who is he to be uh, above reproach and not be able to be criticized by somebody? He hasn't done a great job with that program. So, yeah, I I don't think that uh you know I, I certainly don't agree with people that says hey, Ham can't coach and I, all that stuff. That but there those there aren't a lot of people that are saying that anymore. I think right. people understand what Ham has. Um, you know, if you want to criticize. The roster makeup, I get that too. Like as much as good of moments as Raquan Evans has had this season, he is not a great ACC point guard. You knew you needed to be better there, um, and you brought in Jalen Worley, which is fine. But you also knew he was a freshman that probably wasn't going to be ready. Maybe the roster makeup too to be kind of that weak at point guard in this conference, where you, you don't have a guy, you don't have either point guard. You feel com comfortable shooting, and look around the conference, man. All these teams have point guards that can hit six threes. And Florida State has point guards that won't even take threes. Um, so that that is something that certainly needs to be addressed next year. They have to bring in some more shooting. Right. Yeah, just, you know, it'd be like if, if Jordan Travis were to go down, like you have to calibrate things. But yes. I, I don't know. I would still, I mean, if this team, if he misses the, that's the little thing about it right now, as you were talking, like that's the, that'd be the absolute nightmare scenario. Is that if they they go into the season what with what they have a quarterback and then he goes down week two yeah, but for like the I, year don't because you, then this whole season becomes a wash then it's like well we I don't still agree. don't know what we have I don't agree because I think at that point if this is the quarterback depth chart this Norvell would deserve criticism for that now I know you don't want to criticize a coach for his player getting injured but it would are we going to be stunned if that happens if Jordan Travis it maybe he doesn't get knocked out for the season but he gets knocked out for a half or a game or two games, and you lose those halves or those games. Mike Norvell gets a pass. It's like, man, you've watched this guy play. You know that this is a real uh, you know, scenario that could happen. I don't know if it's a likelihood, but it could happen. It's possible, maybe not probable, but it's possible that he's going to miss multiple games. You knew that because you've watched him play. You've been around him for two years, three years. So how is this what you have behind him? Yeah, I think I, that's a, a real criticism. I was projecting. I yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, I I would be like you've you've gone to the portal and you've nailed and and you know betrayed every other position except for that one. Yeah. As of this recording, yeah. so. Right. Um. But again, you know, that's we'll talk we about that. In, we'll talk about that in October when game day is coming to town and we're like, that's Man, right. You know, well, and they're about to hit beat Clemson to go seven and zero or whatever it would be. That's right. Let's go to Hawaii, y'all. Here we go. Spartan old seven one. It's Ralph Aloha, creator and money balls. How's it? What's up, Ralph? Last week when I told you about my leg and ankle injury, Corey asked about the pain. I felt my fibula break, and I had pain for a few minutes until the injury went numb. I had a small constant pain in the ankle area from what I thought was a sprain, not realizing until the x-ray was taken that the ankle actually moved out of alignment from my foot. The real issue was that we were about 500 feet up this uneven terrain, so I had to crawl to the bottom where a vehicle could medevac me. Holy smokes. Wow. Now, this was the most painful part of the ordeal. The best way to describe the fall is to remind you of the Treadwell tackle about seven years ago against Auburn. Oh, no. That was Ole Miss, Auburn, like last play of the game. Ole yeah. Miss is going in to win the game. He gets tackled, and his ankle just bends just unnaturally. I basically fell back onto myself. Anyways, surgery Friday was a success, and I'm on the road to recovery. Can't lie. I'm enjoying the baths from Miss Ingrid. Winky eye emoji. <laughs> Okay. Live that life, Ralph. Live it, man. My question for the week. Do we really think that the big name coaches are the difference? Or is it how well a team gels and works together that is the key to success? For me, give me a team of players and coaches that have been together for a few years over a first year staff, but ultimately we will see come the fall. As always, love you guys. Drink the Luna products and go war chant. Oorah. Keep enjoying those baths, Ralph. Yeah, Sounds indeed. fun, man. Yeah. I haven't had a bath in a minute. You ever bathe? You no, ever get in a bath? It's been a long, long time, man. One of these days I'll get a house where I have like a jetted tub as well as like an actual shower. How long do you think it's been legitimately since you've had a bath? Oh, M man. Middle school? No. I mean like a like a legitimate bath where I've like soaked in the water and I've used that to bathe and cleanse myself in like a child. Childhood. 
Basically, my, what pro- about, my mom's like, here's Johnson & Johnson. You can use this, and yeah. you'll get in your eyes and cry, so you can do this by yourself. Now. Good luck. Like a bubble bath. Yeah. But a bubble bath, like, I don't know, man. It's, you know, I've, 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 been, I've soaked in a whirlpool, like, at a, at a, night, at a not a nightclub, at a fitness club. But, at no, a nightclub. That's a cool club. Yeah. Let's, what's it called? Uh, it's recess? I see you recess. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah. Uh, but no I, no, I cannot. Oh, man. Maybe middle. I guess I I'll feel like I did it. one in my 20s. I can't remember the scenario. I feel like I tried it. With bubble baths, I got on a like a maybe a two week bubble bath kick, oh. uh, just to soak. Yeah. You know, back when I was working out a little bit more than I am now, I'm gonna get back on that train though. Legitimately, it's coming up here soon. Get ready, everyone. Um, but yeah, I feel like I did that a few times. But you're right. I don't know that I was like. That's not a great way to get clean. Yeah. You're just soaking in your own filth. Correct. Um, but hey, Ralph, God yeah. bless you, buddy. <laughs> do what you got to do out there. It sounds fun. Um, so, and I'm yeah. really sorry that you you're going through what you went through, man. I hope you uh, I hope you heal up just fine. Hell of a story, though, man. Hell of yeah, a story. you need the one story that ends with a bath. Uh, you know, th- you know that's a that's a pretty cool story. That's a fun journey. Maybe not fun. That's probably not the right word, right. but interesting journey. Uh, as far as this question, um, I can't get over the bath. I don't. What was the question? Oh, it was about the the big name coaches, the coordinators. I assume is what he's talking about. Right. Right. Um, yeah, no, there's no, I don't know. I haven't looked at like, I haven't broken down the numbers. I don't know that you have a better likelihood of having a great team with coordinators that we know, you know, good coordinators. Sure. Like Brent Venables. Yeah. Brent Venables is better than Adam Fuller. He is a better defensive coordinator than Adam Fuller. I'm a hundred percent confident saying that. I don't know how many other guys I would say. Absolutely. He knows a lot more than Adam Fuller. I would like to see what Adam Fuller looked like with Clemson's players. I assume he'd look better. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's it's hard to know for sure. It's hard to gauge that. I don't think big names make a big-time team. It's just when I was bringing that up the other day, it was just like, yeah, you, you've hired two coaches from two smaller schools. Your rivals have gone and gotten one from Michigan and one from Auburn slash Tennessee slash Maryland. Um, so, you know, in that regard, they have a guy that's more proven. Doesn't mean that Kevin Steele will be a better D.C. in 2022 or have a better defense in 2022 than Adam Fuller will. Yeah, I mean, I think that defense is very talented. Now I know they lost that uh, Silvera kid in the in the middle that kind of anchors things, but they had some young guys. They had some freshmen that were five stars, so they've they've got talent on that defense, and they just kind of played pretty undisciplined. Uh, I don't think like Kevin Seal is going to let that kind of stuff slide. I just I feel like he's a guy that can almost instantly flip your fortunes on defense. Not, not that they were a terrible defense, not that they're going to become an elite right. defense, but. I, I would imagine by every meaningful metric, they're going to get noticeably better. So that's that's a little bit nerve wracking. But that's a guess. You don't know that, yeah, right? right. It's an assumption. It's not. It's not a hundred percent fact yet. We'll see. Hey, we'll talk about it when we get to that game, right? Yeah. We'll revisit this when the the Knolls are getting ready to play the Canes. I just and I like like Gaddis. I don't know how much of it was Gaddis, how much it was Harbaugh, but you know, there's like a little bit of throwback to what they were doing in Michigan. Like, that's why I like yeah. Kyle Shanahan so much. Like, Kyle Shanahan throws some, I don't know, we can make all the jokes about him not being able to score in the second half of playoff right. games. Yep, I remember. Uh, but, but you know, offensively, man, they, they don't run a lot of pretty fancy. I mean, they, they're a physical team, and they've, they run creative stuff, but it's not, like, gimmicky and hokey. I can't explain it. Just, I really like watching the San Francisco 49ers play offensive football. Uh, like I liked watching Jim Harbaugh call plays when he was in, with the Niners. Uh, you know, Michigan did not look good against Georgia. I get it, but otherwise, man, they were th- that was a team that that produced. So, I and mean, there was an aspect of that that I liked. This whole like pro style offense was, you know, with tempo. Like, I'm like, I don't know, man. Like I was excited to see that the offense hasn't been exciting uh, other than that first half against North Carolina in, in 2020. It was was Gattis a was he a co OC? Like, I think. Why did he leave, leave Michigan for Miami? Um, I, I'm thinking maybe he had, maybe he was a little bit let down that he didn't get the head coach, like that Harbaugh came back because oh, they were saying right. that he was going to be the head, he would probably be in the running for the head coaching job if Harbaugh took the NFL job and then maybe he got ahead of his skis or something. He was a little bit too excited. Um, oh, all right. And oh, like, oh, so it's like he couldn't, the, the, he, Harbaugh maybe didn't want him back on the staff because he felt like he was too excited to take his place. Maybe that. Or maybe or like Gattis like, like, dude, like, I, I just can't come back here. Like, I, I mean, apples, oranges. But like when I was in Mississippi, I interviewed for um, like SEC Network and I didn't get that job. And I remember I'm just like, man, like just instantly being like, well, this sucks. Like I'm going to have to stay here in Mississippi. Like I don't want that. 
I thought well, I had kind of what Harbaugh. It's what it's what Harbaugh's doing though, right? He went and interviewed for the Vikings and didn't get it. Now he's got to go back and coach those kids and work with those coaches that know that know he wanted to go somewhere else. Yeah, it's odd. It's an odd dynamic there. Yeah, but no, they had a he had a co OC. It was Gaddis and uh, Sharon Moore, who's their offensive line coach. Okay. Um, yeah, Gas young dude. He's thirty eight years old. Uh, he was he was at Alabama in eighteen, and then he was a co offensive mm. coordinator, wide receivers coach, and then Michigan took him away. Um, so now yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm all about the romanticism of sport. Like I get it. Like you know, we've all been together. We've gelled. You know, uh, character beats. You know, culture beats scheme. I get that. Um, but you know, having both is pretty cool too. So let's continue. Let's go to Mark. He's in Naples. M. Adam C. Z. Wake up. Interesting question Tuesday on Seminole Headlines. A listener asked what kind of restaurant the guys would open, who would do what, and what it would be called. So let's hear what you guys would do. I think it obviously would need to be called the Wake Up Cafe, serving plenty mm. of Luna coffee. I think Corey would be the head chef cooking up many varieties of potato dishes that he loves so much. Right, yeah. Aslan, what say you? I'd, I'd, I'd have like a brunch place. I'm a big brunch guy. Big, big brunch Me too. Guy. The problem, though, is you got to get up darn early at those places. Like, you know what I mean? I think I would, my brunch would start, I think those brunch places, they probably open at 9 a.m. probably. Yeah. Eight, maybe. My brunch place is opening up at brunch time. Yep. So it's 11.30. Yep. To 3.30. And that's it. We're done. We're done. That's it. That's right. No, that's all we're doing. So I get there at 11, make sure things are going smoothly. You've got the you've got the grill already working. Mm-hmm. And I'm more of just a meter and greeter. I go around and see how people's food is, get complaints, compliments. Yeah, I'm at the back uh, yelling. I'm the Gordon Ramsay mark. Yeah. I'm like yelling at everybody like, what yeah, is Yeah, order this? up. Order yeah. up. You're, you're the order up guy. Yeah. Um, 86, the hash browns. You're that guy, and I'm just the guy that's going around kind of soothing people's nerves because they hear you in the back just screaming at everyone. Mm, yeah. We'd have like a, I'd have swine free Saturdays where all the all the options on the menu would, would come with substitutions that didn't have pork, so it wouldn't. It'd be like you know, chicken sausage, okay. turkey okay. bacon. Well, I um, think that's always going to be an option, though. Well, you know, some places, that we have to do it for a Saturday. Well, you, know, well, you know, some places don't offer that kind of stuff. It hurts your. And I also though. think every every Friday night it's uh what do we it's the wake up cafe after dark. Oh. We open up at 11 p.m. and we just go till we go. Oh yeah, like breakfast, but classy breakfast, not yeah. you know like. Uh, well, we got we serve Waffle cocktails too. Okay, we serve yeah. cocktails too. Yeah, all right, yeah, we're there. And we're we have there. a we have a bathtub. Okay, we gotta have a the bathtub section. So, <laughs> any restaurateurs out there that want uh, some guys face of their organization, we're here for you. Yeah, I think those were all great ideas. Mark continues as far as Florida State athletics. This should be a very interesting spring for you guys to cover. I agree. Are you excited or nervous about what you will see? Did we go enough? Did we do enough, rather? Did we do enough to somewhat replace the production from Jermaine and Kier? We try. I mean, the the, the verse thing was good, but he's just one man, and Jermaine's <laughs> beyond human right. expectations. So they, they got to do a little bit better there. But, again, listen, Jermaine was just a freak. Did we get the guys at wide receiver who can finally make some plays and help Jordan through the air? I do think so, right, Corey? You Got. Well, we'll see. I, I think when we talk about this particular spring, I think I did it last year too, but it was just so – like you talk about being nervous. I won't be nervous because, I, yeah, you know, yeah. look what we've done the last four years. Like look what we've covered. Um, so we've already felt rock bottom. But the, the, the main thing I will be looking at in the spring, and I know it's like the, the easy to do because it's where the ball goes, but I, I think the receivers are the story of the spring. I just think verse two – See who else maybe steps up on the defensive line that's maybe taken a step, gotten bigger, gotten better in the last uh, six months since they got on campus or eight months since they got on campus, talking about the freshmen from last year. Um, you're going to want to see what these early enrollees look like at every position. But by and large, I think the story of the spring and really the story of August, the story of the preseason into the regular season is what are you going to get from these receivers? So I am very excited to see that, just to see what it looks like. And hopefully I won't have to report back negatively like I did last year. Will Tate, will AJ step up to push Jordan and be reliable backups if he gets knocked out of a game? Eh. Is this the most interesting spring you'll cover since joining War Chant, or does another spring session come to mind as being more intriguing? Lots on the line for Mike and this program, he says Norvell. Uh, You know I'll be rooting for a tremendous step forward. As always, go Knowles. 
I'll always say the Jameis spring, although that was different because we didn't get to cover it. Like, we weren't there every day. Like, mm-hmm. this, we're going to be there every day actually watching practice. Um, but I think the Jameis one was a little more intriguing because, again, Jacob Coker was highly thought of. Like, it was not – and Clint Trickett was a returning starter, so it was not a guarantee that Jameis Winston, as a redshirt freshman, was going to win that job. Um, that got lost in the shuffle of everything else, but that really was – there really was some question – uh, whether Jameis was going to win that job. Now the spring game kind of told us everything we needed, but yeah, I, this is a really this is a really interesting one, man. This is you've got what you're going to have what twelve transfers, eleven or twelve transfers, something like that. Um, you've got a freshman quarterback that needs to grow up in a hurry. Um, you've got all these other young kids from the last two years that you want to see if they've made any strides. Uh, yeah, it'll be a really interesting one. Yeah. I don't know, maybe eighteen with Willie, just because that was such a crazy yeah. time. You know, it was like Rocky Three when, you know, everything was going crazy and Rocky's training camp for the first fight against Clubber. You're like, this is great, man. We're doing awesome. This is we're yeah. Gonna, we're gonna, yeah, he's going to crush Clubber Lang. Uh, didn't work out that way. But what I will say that, you know, makes you a little bit nervous. I remember one of the, the things I was most excited about for being able to watch practice, and there wasn't a lot because it involved waking up early in the morning, which I just don't like doing. But was the whole thing, Corey, right? Was we yeah, can but go the watch spring, the... we don't have to open up. We, the, this is true. the spring's late. Right, right. Yeah, it's got, yeah, I think it's going to be 4 yeah. p.m. this year or something like that. He in has the historically. Practices. Yeah, he has historically yeah. done spring in the afternoons. And then, um, which, by the way, we'll speak to some players at 1, 1 o'clock or one thirty uh, later mm. today. So uh, tune back in for that on the Warchant uh, channel on YouTube as well as Warchant.com. But the one thing that was kind of cool about being able to watch practice all season long was, and in camp was like, all right, like we're going to know – what this team is. We're going to have educated opinions, more so than we usually have. We always have educated opinions, but a little bit more so. Right. Uh, you know, but at no time, I never thought that that team was going to be 10-2. and two. I never thought they were going to be 0-4. Oh like, I never, you never could tell by the way, that, and that was the thing. I'm like, you, you, you play how you practice. It was never, and maybe Ira can speak to it better because Ira was there every waking minute of every single practice. I think Austin was as well. I would kind of, you know, when you know everything had gone sideways, I was like, all right, man, I'll, I'll be here for the, the last of it and, and record it. But there was times where I'd get there and watch most of the practice. Now, Corey mentioned on the show the other day, there was, you know, we probably should have sounded the siren on these receivers not being able to catch the ball, not being able to get open uh, much with much greater sort of urgency and concern. Uh, I just hope, I just hope like we'll – we'll be able to have a better understanding of where this thing is going to go and what's going to happen on a week-to-week basis because you know, they would do some things during practice where you're like, golly, like who's going to stop them? Like, Look at them right now. They're going up and down the field, I and mean, then Jordan looks amazing. And then there were some times where you're just like, man, they can't catch the football. They cannot right. block anybody, uh, which I don't know. I, mean, I just kind of chalked it up to like, yeah, you're, you kind of want that. You don't want to see somebody one side of the ball dominate the entire time. I just hope that we'll we'll have a maybe now that we've seen it in, in person and seen how it works on Saturdays. Now we'll kind of know better uh, and have apples to apples sort of stuff, so we have a better a better sort of gauge of where we're going to go. So that's all I hope for. I agree. I agree with you, Aslan. FSU fan, thank you, Corey. Twenty twelve oh seven. Hi guys. I missed the memo on my previous post, so I never did my formal introduction. Mm. Thanks, man. He's been around since September two thousand and nine. Oh, this is okay. only his 23rd ever post. Efficient. Yeah, it picks his spots. I yeah. was born in Brandon, Florida, but I grew up in Sefner. It's all right next to each other. I went to Armwood High and was the equipment manager when we won back-to-back titles in 2003 and four. We were state runners up in 2005 when we lost to Team Tim Tebow. He was so big and strong, he was playing nose guard in the fourth quarter. Oh, boy. Is that true? I probably he wouldn't lie. Why would why would our man lie to us? Like you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let us lose thirty minutes for the rest of our lives. Right. Not sure who was born in Sefner, but some famous alums from Armwood High School include Sterling Hoffrichter. He's a punter in the NFL. Matt Jones, former NFL running back. Who? That's Mike Jones. Sorry. And Matt Joyce, MLB player. I think he played for the Rays. Maybe still does. He did. Yeah. 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 Here's my question. What person was the most amazing interview you ever had and why? Thanks for your quality hard work and being awesome. P.S. I've explained my screen name once before, but last time Aslan could not remember, which is totally understandable. But 2012 is the year I got married. 07 is the year I went on a two-year church mission. That sounds very familiar. Okay, I remember, okay. I remember all right. mentioning that. Um, all right, Corey, what was your Mike Wallace moment? What, what person was the most amazing interview you ever had and why? 
Oh man, I, I, I you answer. I, I mean, I'm trying. I'm, I'm racking my brain right here, man. I've, I've interviewed a lot. Um, you go, you go. I mean, amazing is usually like a positive, um, yeah. kind of uh, connotation. Uh, I don't know. You guys, you guys hear me on these zooms. I'm not a good questioner. Terrible interviews. Um, probably, I don't know. Probably some kind of post game high school that you know is slipping my mind. Right, just like real, uh, like emotional, urgent sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, nothing is like coming to mind. I should have probably read this beforehand. Sorry to. Not I think I got my answer. Oh, thank you, Corey. Yeah, Maya Moore. Oh, okay. I, I got to. Uh, I worked my job previously before I came to Tallahassee. Was in Gwinnett County. I covered her for three of her four years there. She was a star as a freshman, um, and I I inter- I interviewed her at her McDonald's All American party, which is actually at a McDonald's. Um, fittingly enough. She was dating the other kid from the area named Ghani Lawal, who ended up playing at Georgia Tech. But they were da- they went to h- different high schools, but they dated um, as seniors, and so they both had their McDonald's party at the same place. And I got like twenty five. 30- thirty. I had talked to her before, obviously, but that was the only real time I got to sit down with her for twenty or twenty five minutes. And if you guys know about Maya Moore's story, she is as graceful. She is just grace. I, I don't know what other word to use for her. She is just an unbelievable person. And that came across when she was 17 years old. It came across when she was 15 years old. She was just different. And I remember telling her coach at the time when she was 15, she was, all these, she was on these U15 teams, U16 teams. She was the best player in the state as a sophomore and a freshman in high school. It's like, I think she might end up being the biggest women's basketball player in the world. Like, she might be the most famous women's basketball player that's ever played. I don't know that she got to that level, but I know she's world famous, and what she did – for her now husband to get him out of prison. If you've seen that 30 for 30, it's an incredible story, and she is an incredible person. Um, I, legit, I don't say this lightly, and I don't say it a lot. I am genuinely lucky to have gotten to spend 20 minutes with her talking to her, even when she was in high school. There's just these people that you meet that you know they're destined for greatness, and you know they have a, a light and a grace about them. And I don't know where that came from with her, but I assume her mom. Uh, I go, to go ahead and say it's genetics. I, that made it sound like she had a horrible mom, and it was amazing that you know she obviously her mom is a very good person too. But yeah, I, Maya Moore, I was uh, just I yeah, I'll never forget be, having the privilege to talk to her and uh, cover her. All right, that that's, a good, good. that's a good enough answer. Yeah, right? thank you. Yeah, I still yeah, don't got know it. one. I'll uh, that's I'll, fine. We'll we'll I'll on brainstorm. That. I'll come back to it okay. at some other point. Uh, carrying on here, not a question, but rather a uh, an ode, a poem. Bourbon is your friend. Uh, bear with me, everybody here. Dave in Barchtown. The best part of National Sign Day was Jimbo's rant against fellow SEC coaches. Jimbo possibly has the fastest cadence of a Southern accent, so it was really hilarious whenever he mentioned slice bread. Slice bread, I think I was supposed to pronounce it with an accent. Slice bread. But what's even better is Mr. Bread's response to Jimbo. Apparently Dave has this response. Here it goes. Dear Jimbo, my journalistic integrity is sandwiched between honesty and source verification. If I Mm. discover a story has even a grain of misinformation, it's toast, and I consider my sources a second to none. We all know college football has been plagued by sourdough for years, so this baloney about not paying players doesn't cut the mustard. Honestly, I PETA, the fool who challenges my journalism. I've got enough Sangak on the SEC to bring the entire FOCIA conference down. Focia? Is that the Focia? I think it's a it's a hard ch sound there. Focia. In closing, I will not tolerate this schmear. If you do not Ooh. retract these accusations leavened against me, leavened, leavened, what do you ever do to bread? I don't know how you pronounce that one. Schmear? He said schmear. Yes, I will not tolerate. What does that have schmear. to do with bread? Well, you put no, it on a bagel. You, s- you put on a bagel. You put what on a bagel? Cream cheese. They call it schmear in the New York. Oh, country. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. If you do not retract these accusations leavened against me or leavened, whatever happens to bread, uh, you'll be hearing from my attorney, rye bread, or worse, my bodyguard, pumpernickel. Mm. Chala at your boy. <laughs> Slice bread. Jeez. And we land this plane. I with- Peter the Fool. That's, that's a solid one, yeah. Dave from Bardstown. Yeah. That's, that, that goes in the Hall of Fame, buddy. That's a good one. I it's Peter- it's Daryl in Thomasville, North Carolina. Captain D underscore 63. Good afternoon, Aslan, Corey. Or rather, good afternoon, Corey and Aslan. Sorry. Hmm. Didn't want to get that wrong. Hope you two are having an awesome day. I was listening to your podcast on Tuesday, or rather Wednesday, 
about the four new transfer receivers that are coming in. You mentioned Ontario Wilson and Keyshawn Helton as possible receivers helping out the core. Question, from what I've seen, neither Pokey nor Keyshawn has stepped up and been consistent the last couple of years, and neither has been close to catching 1,000 yards, even between the two of them. Right. So it makes you think they're going to step up this year as being seniors when they haven't done much up to this point. Wow! Daryl! Daryl, Daryl, bringing the thunder. You sound like me! Bringing the thunder. A little, just, a lot of listening to Aslan. Just this, like, you know, this whole, like, hey, everyone's going to get awesome every year, just year over year, like the stock market. Uh, doesn't happen that way. Personally, Daryl says, I hope our receivers step up this year and have a great year because that will take the pressure off the running backs and the quarterback, and it will be about time for the receiving core to start catching the ball and making some big plays. Sign up for War Chant, drink the Luna, hit the like, and of course, go Knowles. Let's get this ship rolling and win 9 or 10 this year. There he is. That's a guy we all love. God bless, Daryl. I think when you look at the receivers, you could, like, if Pokey's your number one guy, you're in trouble. If Pokey's your number four guy, okay, you might be working with something. He's fast. He has made plays. He made an incredible catch in the Florida game. Uh, he, you know, he's had, you know, he's had moments. He's not a bum. He can play. He's just not a number one guy. He is not a game-changing player, but he can be a fourth. If he's your fourth or fifth guy, you got. I, I think that's a pretty solid receiving core. If he's if he's your one or two, you got issues. You agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, it's like Anthony Polite. When Anthony Polite is your fifth or sixth best scorer, your best player, man, you've got a really good team, really good. And we saw that a couple of years ago. He might have been seventh at some points on that team. When he's your one or your two, okay, you might have some issues. That's that's all. I think that's a that's a fitting comparison. Yeah, man. When it's when it's third and seven. Like, you don't want to be like, Pokey, go get it for us. Yeah. Not, not that he's incapable, but I don't know how many times he can deliver for you. Now, if he's the third read on a play, I feel good about that. I don't know how many, I don't know how many nickelbacks in the ACC are going to overwhelm Pokey. You know, because, I mean, that's who you're assuming is right. probably going to draw the matchup on, like, a, on a third and seven if they're, you know, four wide or going three by one. Uh, so, I, I think in, it's in, in that sort of context, Daryl, that we think, yeah, I mean, you know, like maybe Keyshawn comes and gives a guy a blow, fresh legs, third quarter, yeah. fourth quarter, and can maybe zip by somebody, gives you a little bit something extra as a as opposed to being counted on or relied on, having going out there and getting banged up all all week long, all season long. Uh, let these guys. Everyone's got a role in life, man. We all have a station in life. We all have a role. We all have capabilities and expectations that we can thrive in. I mean, those guys. You know, blame Jimbo, whatever you want to do. Even Willie, like you know, Willie didn't recruit Keyshawn to come here and make a diff, like be an absolute game changer he's like i like this kid like i think he's got good work ethic i think he'd be a good college football player yeah. which you know he's still got some time to figure it out i mean he goes out and catches i don't know 35 for 450 and maybe a touchdown against miami that's pivotal like he'll be remembered um so yeah, yeah it's also it's concept. hard to it's i think it's hard to judge florida state receivers at least recently by numbers because they don't they're they're a terrible passing attack now is it the chicken or the egg do they have a terrible passing attack because of the receivers or because of the offensive line and the quarterback maybe growing and not being great uh passing the ball you know what i mean like yeah. we don't know how many times Keyshawn beats his man and the quarterback didn't see him right. our pokey was open and ran a great route but the the offensive line didn't block it well enough for jordan to get him the ball um, it's hard to know when you have a really bad passing attack who's mainly at fault. I think we all know by this point, though, these guys are not impact game-changing wide receivers. Um, so I was not, if I said that, I certainly wasn't uh, predicting them to have breakout 800-yard, nine touchdown, or 1,000-yard, nine touchdowns seasons, even between them. Like, I think even 35 catches for one of those is probably a, a, asking a lot. But that does not mean they, can, they can't be a valuable part of the offense. And again... 20 catches, if they're the right catches, um, can be a big deal. Lawrence Dossie had, whenever that was, the Peter Tom Willis here, I think, maybe, 89, I think, had 20 catches and nine or 10 of them were for touchdowns. Like, maybe, uh, not that these two are going to do that, but, you know, I, I don't, I know we're not, these guys aren't going to have 50 catches each, but man, they can still be a, a, a solid contributing, solid contributors to, we hope, is a much better receiver core. But let's just hope they're not one and two on your depth chart. What? Because you might be in trouble. Incredible. In what? the year 1988, Lawrence Dossey, Lawrence Lanier Dossey, caught 18 passes, nine of which were touchdowns. There you go. There That's you go. Amazing. Isn't that a crazy number? That's awesome. 
Yeah. yeah I Very don't lie Greg Carr esque. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Similar players. Him and, and Greg he, Carr. And he ran for a touchdown on seven carries. Yeah, that was his. That was Bobby's reverse guy. He liked using him and Ronald Lewis. He liked using those two for the reverse. Yeah. Look at this old Doss guy. Old man. Doss. Go Nears, man. App State. App State. Mountaineers. He's there now. So that was '88, huh? That was '88. I would have 19. thought that would have been uh, the the next year, but yeah. yeah, I guess they were still the Fab Four in '88 too. And then he went 38 for 683 and four scores, and then capped. And it then off I know 65. exactly. Oh, yeah, sorry. he had 999 yards. He did his last year, didn't he? He did, Corey. That's crazy. That's crazy. They couldn't go find an extra yard somewhere. They, they, our man, and also they don't count bowl game. They didn't count bowl stats back then because I'm, I'm almost positive he had over a hundred against Penn State in the blockbuster bowl. If they just added those numbers, he'd have been well over a thousand yards. But instead, my man finished at nine, nine, nine. Mm. It's tough. Sometimes life's not fair, guys. You're right. You're right. All right, we are uh, done most likely for the week, and if something does come across, we will put a show together because that's what we do for you all. But we're doing three a week right now. When spring starts, when we get an official start on that, I'm sure we'll probably ramp back up to five a week because there'll be so many observations, so many takes. It'll be fun. So we leave you with that. Do stay connected to warchant.com. We'll be rolling out, again, previews for the spring season rolling up. Uh, Baseball's getting ever closer. I think fan day's coming up this weekend, right, Corey? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the 12th, I think. So It's all coming. Softball starts on uh, Friday, number six team in the country. Got them uh, starting the season. All right, so that's that. We're not going anywhere. We're just, you know, we'll be around. You know how it goes. And Corey's going to be working on his golf game. So mm, check absolutely. that out, too. Yeah, keep, check, check, that keep, out. Keep, uh, keep updated on War Chant TV for updates on my golf game. Stay tuned, as the kids used to say. For Corey, I'm Aslan. Thank you for listening to Wake Up War Chant. It is, as always, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.